Hi, everybody, and welcome to this edition of the Taking Control of Your Diabetes podcast. I am one of your hosts, Dr. Jeremy Pettis, joined as always by my good friend and colleague, Dr. Steve Edelman. And Steve and I uh, were both diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when we were 15 years old. We're best buds. We are adult endocrinologists. We work at the University of California, San Diego. We see patients do research and also work at the not-for-profit Taking Control of Your Diabetes. So thanks for tuning in. Um, This podcast is going to be on diabetic ketoacidosis, also known as DKA. So we're going to get into what is it, what causes it, how to treat it, all those kinds of things. But just off the top, why why are we talking about this, Steve? Well, DKA is a pretty serious condition. You're going to explain the science of it in a second. But I hate to say this in the beginning of our podcast, but you can pass away mm-hmm. from untreated diabetic ketoacidosis. It's something that's near and dear to every person with type 1 diabetes and many folks with type 2 diabetes. So although it doesn't happen too often, uh, it's important to know about it and do some risk mitigation, which which we'll discuss. So I do want to spend a little time talking about what ketones are. Why does the body make them? What good purpose do they serve? And this requires a little bit of a trip down kind of human physiology lane, if people will bear with me. So let me get out my notebook. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so what what are ketones? Why do they why do they occur? So basically, um, when people with diabetes, uh, like say people with type one, don't make any insulin. It, it is kind of like a state of starvation. The body thinks that it's starving, the insulin's not around, and it needs to make energy. So what happens in a normal person without diabetes when they don't eat for a period of time? Well, their blood sugars start to dip, their insulin levels go very low, and there's some glucose that's stored in the liver that's enough sugar to kind of keep your blood sugars normal overnight. But pretty quickly, you run out of sugar in the liver, and the rest of the energy in the body is really stored in the fat. So if you aren't eating for 12 hours or so, you'll start burning fat. And fat is really good at supplying energy to the whole body, except fat can't get into the brain. So it's this one kind of error in physiology, if you will, that our main source of storing energy is in the fat, but there's no way of getting that energy to the brain. So the workaround that the body has done is that when a lot of you know fat is, is being burned, the liver will turn some of that fat into ketones, and ketones are an energy source that the brain can actually use. So ketones are kind of made when people haven't eaten for a long time as a way of supplying energy to your brain. So they can be a good thing, but... Well, here's the question, Jeremy. For those who are on just a ketogenic diet, not diabetic... Mm-hmm which is very popular, those folks don't go into DK. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is when you have a complete lack of insulin, which is what you know happens in, again, let's say type 1 diabetes, when you don't make any insulin, your body just starts burning through fat. And a lot of that fat is turned into ketones. And when you have too many ketones, that can be, they are acids. So that's why it's diabetic ketoacidosis. People can become acidotic. And that is where you get into problems. You can stop breathing. You can have seizures. You can pass away from this because your body basically is just burning through fat, gets turned to ketones, and that's where the problem comes from. Yeah. And when when you become acidotic, um, like you just said, it affects every organ in your body, every Mm -hmm. function. And it's a very serious condition. And the other important thing about what I just said is... I didn't say anything about glucose levels at all. You know, so a lot of times people will say, well, I have ketones because my blood sugars are high. Well, yes, but it's really that you just don't have any insulin circulating in your body. And your blood sugars being high can be a sign that you have ketones, but it, high blood sugar doesn't cause ketones, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And when I was a fellow at the Jawson Clinic a zillion years ago, my first presentation was on what they called euglycemic DKA, which is, it could fool you if your blood sugars aren't high, you still can be having, going into DKA. Mm-hmm. That's important to note. So, you know, most people know DKA because it was probably how you were diagnosed. When I was 15, when Steve was 15, we both went into DKA. It was no fun. Um, but it's still very, very common. We know that about 5% of type 1s a year are still admitted to the hospital or go to the emergency room. Um, So a lot of times people think, oh, DKA is just a problem for kind of quote unquote bad diabetics that aren't paying attention. No, it can can happen really to anybody. And so not only is it common, um, 
But while we're very good at treating it, it still has a mortality rate. It still can kill people. So we get kind of used to, you know, treating it, taking insulin, things like that. But it's a very serious thing and it's common. So we need to talk about how to avoid it, how to treat it. Yeah. Some of the most common causes other than when you were first diagnosed that happened to you and I um, is, for example, if you wear an insulin pump and the infusion line comes out and you don't realize it. And once again, what you said in the beginning, lack of insulin. Mm -hmm. And if you don't realize it, you can go into DKA pretty quickly. And there's a lot of different situations that allow people to go into DK faster than others. And then of course, you know, people talk about sick day rules, sick day rules. The bottom line is you're sick. And if you're not eating, you st still may need insulin, but not only your normal amount, but twice that amount. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks say, well, I'm sick. I'm not eating. I'm not going to take any insulin. Right. And that's a forerunner of DK. And of course, SGLT inhibitors, which are important drugs to prevent kidney disease and congestive heart failure and, and many other conditions, uh, those can cause euglycemic DKA as well. So there's a, there's a whole laundry list. And the important thing is to realize what are the early symptoms, which we'll get yeah. into. And usually there's kind of a perfect storm. Somebody's infusion set might get kinked or they're not getting insulin. And then, you know, they have a cold or a flu and their insulin requirements are higher and that can push them into, into DKA. And you, and people might be listening um, and you might've had mild DKA one time when your, you know, your pump fell out or whatever, and you kind of felt achy or sore, whatever it might be. So Steve, what are the signs and symptoms? Yeah. This is, this is very important because we've all had high blood sugars after eating a hot food Sunday, but we had insulin on board. We may not have taken enough, but lack of insulin is a very specific feeling. You get, like you just said, you get muscle aches, dry mouth, lethargic, tired, weak. It's more than just hyperglycemia. And if I may, I want to tell you a story I've never told you, Jeremy. Okay, hit me. I went to Disneyland. Yeah. And I started feeling achy, weak. My kids were young then. I felt my arm where my infusion line when it was all wet. So the insulin was not going in me. It was going in my shirt. Mm -hmm. So I went to the first aid. They said, sorry, we don't have, I wanted to suck some needle, some insulin out of my pump with a needle. They don't carry needles because there's too many drug dealers at Disneyland and they just don't carry it. I got in my car. I drove to a pharmacy. I got some syringes and I sucked it out of my pump and I felt like a drug addict in the parking lot, like mainline mm -hmm. insulin. And you know what? Uh, I, I would have probably been admitted if I was near a hospital. And I think it's important to tell folks that there's different uh, levels of ketosis. So, you know, you can have the end stage ketoacidosis uh, and get admitted to the hospital for IV fluids and insulin. And then there's all the path along the way. And you could have ketones, you can pick up ketones much earlier. Well, you, you reminded me of a similar story where we were actually at a, a diabetes conference. It was in New Orleans. And my pump fell out. I wasn't getting insulin for hours. My blood sugar was like through the roof. I knew I was becoming ketotic, you know, not a syringe or anything in sight. And uh, a friend of ours, Christina Roth, who actually ran the College Diabetes Network, um, came and met me and she had her insulin pump on, but she had an extra infusion set. So I put an infusion set on her stomach unclipped her pump and plugged <laughs> it into me and took like 15 units of insulin and I felt like a cyborg but I swear I just felt as soon as the insulin going in just like you know things kind of starting to normalize but the point is here we are two endocrinologists you know supposedly on top of things and we are but this can happen to anybody so knowing how to treat it knowing how to triage these things is I think you know what we're going to talk about and, and being being prepared uh when you first suspect it and we're going to talk mm -hmm. about that right now right so I remember when I was diagnosed, they said like something crazy, like every time your blood sugar goes over 200, check your ketones, Yeah, you know, which is ridiculous. So when should you check your ketones? Well, any time that your, your blood sugars are, I would say persistently high, certainly over 300 for a number of hours, or your blood sugars are high um, and you have symptoms uh, that we just went through, you're nauseous, you're achy, something just doesn't quite feel right. It's never a bad idea to check your ketones. So. Yeah, you know, and, and if you ask everyone listening with type 1, when's the last time you check your ketones? They'll say, never. Yeah, it was Magnum um, PI was on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Survivor. <Yeah. laughs> um, you know what? Uh, the prop, here's the problem, Jeremy. Uh, to measure the, the important ketone that identifies someone going into DK is called, ready for this, folks, beta-hydroxybutyrate. And you cannot measure that with a urine 
test strip, which you can buy at CVS, mm -hmm. and they'll measure something else called acetoacetate. It's not a good marker, and it won't help you. It could actually mislead you. So you have to have either a little glucose meter, which is not really a glucose meter. It's a meter that measures ketones with a drop of blood, or you have to get it drawn in the emergency room or the hospital. Yeah, and who wants to do that? So, you know, we were talking about the different kinds of ketone meters out there, and the ones that I really recommend for patients, and there might be others, but as far as I know, it's pretty much the only one. It's called the Precision um, Extra Meter, uh, X-T-R-A. They cut out the E because that makes it cool. Um, <laughs> and it literally is a, is a blood sugar meter. Um, so everybody knows how to use this. And if you put in one kind of strip, it measures blood sugar. And if you put in a ketone strip, it'll measure your ketones. So for one meter, depending on the strip you use, it can check your, your blood sugar, your, your ketones. So then you're saying, okay, great. And these things are pretty cheap. You can get the meters for like 20 bucks. The ketone strips are actually quite expensive. Um, like a dollar each. A dollar each, but you like you honestly could have 10 strips and you might be good for the rest of your life, you know, hopefully. So it's something that everybody should have around, including you and I, Steve, to be honest, um, to but measure their but, ketones. But Jeremy, traveling with another meter mm -hmm. is a freaking pain. Yeah. Yeah, we can keep it at home, but if we're at home, we don't need it. Because, you know, we got insulin, we got fluids, we got carbs. Um, it's just a pain. And I th we should mention that Abbott is working on a continuous ketone monitor. Mm -hmm. And that uh, we don't know what that looks like. And I know other companies are as well. And that could be quite helpful. Yeah. And the key there is it is a, is a CGM, continuous glucose monitor, that also has ketones that it can measure. And it's not something that you need to know all the time. You, know, you need to know your glucose all the time, but it could flag you when your ketones are getting to a problematic area. So my approach on that is, you know, why not? If all of our CGMs start being able to measure ketones too, that could be actually helpful. So now if you're listening, you think, okay, great. Maybe I'll order one of these meters. But if I test my ketones, I have no idea you know, what normal, good, bad is. We're very used to what a blood sugar result is, but we just don't measure ketones. So how do we know what these levels are? Yeah, well, you <laughs> you can go through them, but that's going to be an issue because we don't know what someone's baseline ketone production is. You know, if they've been fasting, if they're on intermittent fasting, they may be producing some ketones, but there are some standard levels. Yeah. So in general, and whether, you know, you want to come back to this podcast, listen to these, write these down, uh, you can kind of find these online too. Um, but anything less than 0 0.6, and the units that it used, by the way, is, is millimoles per liter. Um, so anything less than 0 0.6 is normal. Um, if you get between 0 0.6 and 1.5, that's where you get into the kind of the moderate range where you're, you're making some ketones, um, starting to get a little concerning. Um, and certainly above 1.5 is where you would you, you would call that kind of ketosis, that you have ketones, you need to, to act on it. Um, so that's something that, again, you can start to familiarize yourself with. And if you have symptoms, your blood sugars are high, you check your ketones and it's over 1.5, guess what? You're probably in, in at least mild DKA. Yeah, when, when you say symptoms, I think what, two of the most important ones I didn't really mention on the laundry list, uh, when you start to feel nauseated and especially if you can't hold anything down. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's a really important turning point where you're probably gonna need to go to the emergency room because right. you can't drink and, and you can't take carbs. We'll talk about therapy. I should mention there's a lot of other things coming out, including a urine test strip for beta hydroxybutyrate. Yeah. But they're not out yet, but keep your I mean, eyes open. urine strips are just a pain in general. Oh. You, know, you gotta pee and something and dip it, oh. and then you're like holding it up to this thing to try oh. to interpret is that light magenta or deep magenta? It's just ridiculous. But don't forget, you know, in medical school, I was testing my urine. We didn't have glucose meters, and uh, uh, hush puppies were popular back then. So you're at the urinal, and sometimes you, the strip drips. And when you get urine, a drop of urine on your hush puppy, it's permanent stain. Oh, man. Lost a lot of good hush puppies back then. <laughs> <laughs> no, who said I lost it? I kept wearing them. <laughs> All right. So... Let's talk about treatment now. So uh, the key here, like Steve already said, is if you start vomiting, go to the emergency room. But prior to that, you can treat yourself at home and most cases are very treatable and can be reversed at home. So um, the kind of cornerstones are insulin, fluids, and then kind of knowing what your ketones are. So let's start with, with insulin. So first, um, 
when it comes to insulin, you have to assume that whatever insulin you're getting um, is not enough or it's not working. So particularly if you're on a pump, you just have to assume that your infusion set or your pump is not working. So take out your infusion set, change it immediately, and then take a fairly sizable uh, you know, bolus of insulin, but take that insulin through a syringe or a pen so you absolutely know you're getting the insulin. You're not worrying like, oh, is the infusion set clogged or whatever. Take a manual injection, somewhere between seven to 10 units. So a pretty big you know, dose. And I, I've seen people in mild DKA, well, they'll, they'll say, well, my blood sugar is 300, but my pump is recommending like, that I bolus 0.4 units because it assumes that you've been getting insulin, but you haven't. You're way behind. So you have to give a big dose of insulin to kind of help curb the tide, I guess. Yeah, you know, a lot of people don't realize uh, that they should really look at their pump setup if they have an unexpected super high. And I agree with you, Jeremy, a rage bolus. Mm -hmm. And I would say this, in my career... I've never seen anybody get low yeah. giving themselves insulin and DK because the insulin, their body is insulin resistant at yeah. that time because they're sick. And the other thing too is, you know, some people may need a lot more than others. So yeah, just right through your clothes, just give yourself jam a bunch of insulin. Right. And the amount of insulin really depends what you take normally, but just give whatever you decide, do it double. Yeah. And, you know, if you guys want the, the math of it, and if you went to the ER, the dose they would give you is 0 0.1 units per kilogram of your body weight. So if you weigh 70 kilograms, they would give you seven units. If you weigh 100 kilograms, they would give you 10 units to get started. Um, of course, you got to figure out how many kilograms you weigh, and who knows that. But the point is, it's going to be somewhere between like 7, 10, like a big slug. Yeah, the point is, you want to avoid <clears throat> the emergency room. Yeah. And um, okay, so you give yourself a big slug of insulin. Then I would check your blood sugar. Hopefully you're on a CGM, but if you're not, every hour. And initially you can give yourself another correction bolus, I would say every hour. Um, maybe not the whole seven to 10 units again, uh, but then you're looking at you know little taps of three or four units kind of thing to bring your blood sugars down. And like you said, it's, it's very difficult to go low. And even if you did, you give yourself some carbs, like it, but at least you're getting out of DKA. Yeah, look at those trend arrows too. Mm -hmm. All right, so you just checked your ketones or through the roof. Crap, I'm on DKA. I just gave myself 10 units of insulin. What else do I need to do? The other big cornerstone is fluids. And the way that I think about this is when you give yourself insulin, that shuts down your body from making new ketones. But the fluids are helpful to flush out the ketones that are already in your system. So you need to hydrate, you need to start peeing, all of that. And just like insulin, it's it's a little, it's hard to drink too much. This isn't like Steve on a Saturday night where he's throwing back margaritas. <laughs> but um, you need to drink a lot of fluids. And so water is great or uh, these kind of zero calorie electrolyte, electrolyte beverages like Gatorade Zero or Powerade Zero, but make sure they're the ones that, you know, don't have sugar. And, you know, drink three to four glasses of water right away or two or three of these bottles of these, of these Gatorade beverages. Um, and then again, a couple glasses or a couple bottles every hour to stay really hydrated. Yeah, and I, I could add one more thing is carbohydrates. Now, a lot of people are really surprised. Your, bl your blood sugars may be high, you're going into DK, and you're supposed to take carbs. Of course, carbs with a ton of insulin. And apparently, carbohydrates go to the brain, they cross the blood-brain barrier, and it turns off the brain's drive to produce ketones. Uh, and I've heard that's one of the most effective things you can do, but of course, with the two other cornerstones. Yeah. And there is, uh, we talked about getting uh, DKA with SGLT inhibitors, which are used quite frequently in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Uh, and they, caught, they talk about the STITCH protocol. ST is stop. The medication, of course, insulin, carbs, and hydration. Mm -hmm. And I think those are universal mitigation tools that you could do at home. Right. And, you know, these SGLT medications aren't approved yet for people with type 1 diabetes. And the, the main bugaboo for getting them approved is that they do increase the risk of DKA. These are fantastic medications, and it's 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 we're hopeful that with the advent of these continuous ketone monitors, or just you know knowing how to check ketones at home, that eventually we'll start using them more and more in type ones. So another you know real reason of doing this podcast is that reminding us of, of DKA kind of uh, mitigation and, and and educating folks. Yeah, and even though they're not approved, there are a lot of folks with type one whose kidney doctors you know swear by them to help prevent the progression of kidney disease, and cardiologists mm -hmm. who you know awesome at preventing people at risk for congestive heart failure. So I think the purpose of this whole 
podcast has for people to be aware that this DK can happen. If you could recognize it early and treat it efficiently at home, you can save yourself a trip to the ER and potentially the intensive care unit where a lot of people with DK are treated. Yeah. And I think, you know, this helps take out the fear of some of like, you know, diabetes. This is a dreaded complication. And if you feel that you're well equipped at home, hey, if my blood sugars go high and I get some ketones, I can treat it and I can get back into range. And then you really can kind of go about your business. You know, hopefully you've changed your infusion set, you've taken your basal insulin, whatever. Um, don't feel like this is going to happen all the time. You know, these things do happen. The little speed bumps, you treat it, and you kind of go go about your day. Yeah, and every, every one of you wearing an insulin pump, including an Omnipod, um, you know, <laughs> what can happen will happen when you're not prepared. Yeah. And so always, when I go on a bike ride with my good friend Bill Polanski, I got my Omnipod. Yeah, I'm never I, invited, just you and Bill. <laughs> <laughs> I always bring an insulin pen. Yeah. Because I get sweaty, it falls off, I pull it off by accident, and you could be stuck in the middle of nowhere with no insulin. And that's that's a serious situation. Yeah. Well, I hope, um, anything, closing thoughts you no, have about I, this? No, I would say it's been a pleasure speaking to our listeners, and uh, hopefully you all learned something from it. We helped you go on living a long and healthy life with yeah. diabetes. We just want to say, as always, please like, subscribe, share. Really enjoy doing this. Hope this is educational for you guys. And again, please come back and listen to this. Even if you are in DK, that you can play this right when it's happening and um, treat it <laughs> and keep you out of the ER. So um, thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next one.